What's up, everyone? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long, and today I have uh, Jason Rukowski on the podcast. I, I reached out to Jason after seeing some really uh, thoughtful, cool tweets that he's done, and uh, I saw he has a, follows the same people I do, is in the same kind of community of short sellers and stuff. So I decided to reach out to him. So Jason is a short seller focused trader in, in the small cap land, and he's going to uh, talk more about that. But yeah, I just reached out to him and just uh, I like to use the podcast to get in touch with traders that are like minded, uh, seems like they know what they're doing. They're on the right path, up and comers, successful traders. So uh, here to, you know, um, put Jason out there and see, you know, what information we can share in the community and and uh, and, and know about his story. So what's up, Jason? How's it going? Pretty good, man. How you doing? Great, man. Great. You know, it's just uh, another day in this market. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, slow market. Yeah, yeah very. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll talk a lot more about that, but a weak, slow market going on here. Yeah, so. it's like, yeah, it's just like waiting for the right time to, to strike. You know what I mean? Just kind of yeah. waiting. For, yeah, know? there's opportunity, but uh, you yeah. kind of have to know because there's low range, low volume, and uh, especially in yeah. small cap space. And you have to be kind of selective in what you're what you're trading. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh for it's it's about like um like not oversizing into a, a not so ideal setup because you're trying to force something. You know what I mean? It's like you gotta oh, yeah. remind, remind yourself oh, yeah. to to just wait and stay stay the course. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, nothing worse than uh, losing money on a trade you shouldn't have taken. Yeah, yeah, man, tell me about it. So, uh, <laughs> all right, cool. So, so let's um let's get a background um sure. about yourself. Okay, uh, that's a general general background. Like where you're from. How you got sure started, stuff like that. Yeah, man. So I'm um, from Chicago, Illinois, which is where I'm currently located. Um, no, you asked me how I got started. Uh, it's funny. I, I started trading about four years ago. Uh, the way I discovered small cab trading was I was working a advertising job at a company, and I came across a Business Insider article that was like. Uh, you know, 10 ways people under 30 made a million dollars. I was like, I'll click that. So I read it and like number nine, all the way down was uh, Tim Gratani, his, his uh, day trading um, and, it, and it linked to his blog. And I was like, oh, like, oh, you know, I always been interested in the markets, but I never traded myself. Like I'll just go in there and see what that's about. And it kind of just opened this world of, of uh, small cap, low float, uh, day trading that I had no idea about. So um, I just, when I see something interesting, I just go down the rabbit hole and, uh, you know, I found his blog and that leads to FinTwit and that leads to the chat rooms and that leads to the DVDs and all that stuff. So just like a lot of people get started in this, uh, in this market, in this niche, um, you know, uh, you, you kind of find the most visible public people and then you kind of filter out what people you resonate with, what people you don't resonate with. And uh, then you start watching the market and you start trading. So uh, yeah, that's what I did. That was about four years ago. Um, four I'll years say, ago. yeah, I'll say that uh, first two years, not profitable, maybe a year and a half, not profitable. Um, I was pretty smart to realize that uh, when I first put money in the market, I was like three months into studying and I'm like, I'm ready. I'll put money in the market. Why not? And then, uh, I, I traded some like 1 million float stock that went like up 300%. And like, I lost like 20% of my count in a day. That was like our first trade. And I was like, uh, I always tell people it's a good thing to lose in the beginning because you don't get too confident. Um, but yeah, I kind of, I kind of took a back seat to that. And I was like, dude, if I keep doing this, I'm just going to lose all my money right away. And uh, I took it real slow, real, real slow. And uh you know, I just had, I had an account over PDT and I just made these little 100 share trades. And I did that for about a year and a half until I can prove myself that, uh, you know, I knew what I was doing at least enough to size up. Because the thing is, if you can't make money with a hundred shares, you're not going to make money with 10,000 shares. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like there's no reason, uh, to be aggressive in the beginning. Um, because it's just, you don't know enough. You just don't have enough experience. Um, and whatever framework you're using to trade, which is usually probably just copied from some DVD or chat room that you're following, uh, there's too much you don't know, and who knows how good that thing really is, and that type of thing. And uh, so I took it slow, and then yeah, after a couple years, probably 
it's sometime in 2020 when the market started going really crazy. I started figuring things out more and uh, started a lot more things started connecting. And I kind of built a framework. I kind of ditched all the, the the chat room guys and the DVD guys. And I really built a framework around um, all day faders on Twitter. Probably like my most favorite FinTwit guy um, in terms of how I look at the market nowadays. So things like, you know, uh, float dilution fundamentals volume liquidity uh kind of like how to size in moving averages level two tape reading like he really introduced me to all those concepts and i just i found it so interesting and i just went down every rabbit hole you follow you, each of those ones whether it's dilution or moving averages whatever it is you just go down that rabbit hole you back test everything you just spend thousands of hours doing it and uh Hopefully you build some type of framework that makes sense to you. So, and then ever since then, I, I, I've, uh, I've been profitable with pre every month for two years straight and just building on the framework and uh, just trying to improve. And that's really uh, where I'm at today. So cool. Okay. So, so a couple of things there. All right. So, so you started four years ago, today's 2022. So 2018 ish. Yeah. Uh, so before the pandemic mania, right. so you were doing two years about one year of a hundred shares, more or less. Oh yeah. You, you knew that you didn't know and you didn't want to blow that over PDT account, which is, that's like so key. I, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. I, mean? I literally so had like key. a 30 K account. <laughs> like I think that's <laughs> what I yeah. started with. Yeah. So, um, and you mentioned that 1 million float in the beginning took you, you know, you got a big hit from that. You learned right away. Did you even know about float? To, did you learn about float the hard way through that? Um, I think I, I think a, a few of the chat room guys talked about it and it didn't immediately connect like what, you know, it's kind of like the basics of supply and demand. And, but at that, at that point, I just didn't know anything about micro cap manipulation, uh, silky yeah. floats, rigged micro cap patterns. So nowadays, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about patterns and stuff. Uh, almost everything I post on Twitter is about uh, this, this concept of, understanding how liquidity works in the microcap space and how people with very large accounts abuse liquidity in the microcap space to move stocks in specific ways, right? So it, it, it's patterns based on what it, you're, what these people moving these stocks are able to do, right? And that it's based on market conditions. It's based on recent themes and patterns. It's based on where in the cycle we are, how much money's flowing into the microcap space. And all this stuff adds up to, to what, what certain stocks and certain tickers, and, and then you mix in, you know, fundamentals and institutional ownership and dilution. What, what is capable of happening and what are the odds of certain things and certain patterns happening given you know, where we are in the market and what's happening. And, and specifically for that ticker and who that ticker is um, and, and just what are the odds of it doing certain moves based on things like float, th things like volume, you know? So uh, didn't know any of that in the beginning and I didn't know a single thing about any of that stuff. Um, but very slowly over time, uh, I learned more and more and I've, this is very much how I view the microcap space in general. Um, there's a lot of things based on liquidity and manipulation, right? So that's what I trade. So very interesting. I think I, I, I that's how I got in touch with you with, uh, with reaching out on Twitter. You made some interesting comments about this, this, this topic. So, um, so yeah, you, you, 2020 comes along the pandemic, you see more opportunity. Now you get into the rabbit hole of all day faders. You mentioned you probably trade the matrix as well. I'm assuming. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Huge. I'm a huge trade fan. Going going into that and talk, you know, knowing about the manipulation and the rigors involved and right. institutional ownership, the float, the rigor controlling the float, and um, all this stuff. And, oh yeah, you know, level two tape. So, did that just click for you? Uh, like when you just it just an epiphany happened. You started to go deeper in the rabbit hole. Now it's starting to make sense, and you're putting the puzzle together with dilution and yeah. all that. So yeah, what was that like? fun for you to figure out like to get into or because that, that takes a certain personality to be able to oh yeah you gotta the, the thing about that is it's it's 
in the beginning, you're very excited because you learn about these things about dilution or you're learning about rigged patterns and all this type of thing. And, and, or things like even just VWAP and moving averages and stuff like that, like uh, different things you can use. Um, you get really excited, like, oh man, I'm going to use this. We'll make tons of money. Like, you, you know, I, on my Twitter, I'll talk about, you know, uh, ATM phase. I'll talk about warrants that have been recently adjusted and exercise price. And then a stock gets pumped on, you know, in the pre-market on no news and, you know, it's uh, how dilution fades work and how, what technical patterns they follow. You get very excited about it. Um, but it takes the, the, the hard part is understanding what's important and when it's important, right? It's, 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 you know, I always get people messaging me on Twitter and stuff about, oh, hey, these guys have warrants or these guys have a, an ATM. And I'm like, well, here's the details you need to consider, right? There's, there's certain, um, for example, talk about ATM fades, beautiful thing. They go straight down. That's awesome. You, you can literally short and then leave your computer and then come back in five hours and then you're up 40%. It's great. But it only works that way when certain conditions are met. For example, uh, the best dilution fades either just pump in the pre-market and immediately start fading in the pre-market. That's how the most of them work. Um, they give one tiny push at market open. That's the second way they work. Or uh, they're intraday parabolics, which is very rare, but extremely, extremely good, extremely good odds. Um, so for example, a recent ATM fade, just talk about some details, is UBX from, what day was this? Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, November 1st, 2022, for anyone listening to this in the future. Um, UBX, this is a very classic dilution fade. Um, stock gets pumped. And they hold it up, they, they, they give an initial burst of volume because it's very easy to move a stock in the pre-market, right? Low liquidity, no halts, it just thin. It's easy to pump a stock. So a common method, if you want to abuse retail liquidity to tap into your dilution is to pump a stock at nine in the morning. You know, it could be, you can release the PR early and then it starts like going down. And then at nine, there's an issue. And we saw this with SNAL, um, Another, which is was a one million float stock, is you just pump it right before market opens. Everyone starts looking at it, and then you use the market open volume, which unless it's crazy strong, unless it's millions and millions and millions of shares, like really really strong, um, it's going to give one tiny push, and then it's just going to immediately reject and go straight down. Right. So this is an example of abusing how traders scan for stocks, how they get interested in stocks, how retail gets attracted to what to trade at market open to generate as much liquidity as possible so you can tap into that atm and ubx did the classic thing where it just gave one tiny push um couldn't even reach a uh, pre-market uh, pre high a day um pulls back the the volume immediately gets cut in half it just decreases almost right away and then it's just straight it was like i, I traded that it was like a straight down 20 percent fade and 20 minutes or something like that. And that's just how, that's an example of how dilution mixes in with technical analysis and also a framework of how, you know, because it, it can make sense. It makes sense to why a stock that's pumped right before market open is just doing that to abuse the market open volume to do whatever this company is looking to do. Um, and so a very common market open strategy for me is shorting stocks that pump like, You'll see these like 9 a.m. pumps. This happened on NURO uh, a, a yeah. week or two ago. Again, a classic, just pump it at 9 a.m., do a high day clear out. And then I just shorted at the top. And then it just it, it went down like 30, 40% by the end of the day. Um, and they're just dumping. They're, they're just using, they're abusing the pre market to, to dump into market open. And that's just like one example, right? There's so many examples of this. But um, that's one example of in the micro cap space, it's, it's just all this game of abusing volume abusing liquidity it could be for dilution and sometimes it's it's just some person moving the stock some person you know buys half the float of a three million uh, share float company and depending on how much liquidity is in the system and how strong the micro cap market is um, and how much they're willing to soak and push it's 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 they're just moving it because it's it's easy money. I mean, if these, if these people, who knows? I mean, who knows how big these people's accounts are and how coordinated they are and how many people are doing it? But it's it's 
they, they just must have like hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, it, like it, it, it must just be a huge, huge game to these people, whoever, who, who's ever actually moving these stocks. Um, but yeah, it's very important to know that stuff because it also help you not get caught, right? It, like if you understand like what super strong patterns exist in strong markets, it, it, like whenever the microcap market gets very, very strong, I always tell people, it's like, you either get in with a good average or you don't trade. You don't, you don't short lower highs. You don't take starters and add the losers. Like you don't do any of that crap. You, 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 you target very specific liquidity events that could lead to a fade. But of course in strong markets, a lot of times they don't, they find support and go back up, but you got to try because you never know. Um, uh, especially once you get later in the day, it could be much higher odds, but you have to know, depending on the market conditions, like what your capable, what's, what your risk management profile needs to be. Because in strong markets, you need good averages for tight risk. Like that's really what you need. Because otherwise, if you start chasing or you start shorting lower highs, you're just, you're just liquidity from the next squeeze up, right? So it's, it's you, one really hard part of trading is recognizing the changes in the micro cap cycle, like how strong and how weak things are getting. Um, because the, the most money to be made by far is when something goes from really weak to really strong or really strong to really weak. Um, especially if you're a short seller, going from really strong to really weak is huge, huge. I mean, th this happened in October. is huge money because you'll get things that will gap up 80, 90% and then reject VWAP once and fall. I, th that happened with some ticker uh, that I shorted. I can't actually remember what that was. RMED, R-M-E-D. Uh, that's right when that the the PEGY and all the big multi-day runners, multi-day runners were a big thing, just pushing, pushing, pushing. But strong cycles, especially nowadays, um, are lasting shorter and shorter than they used to back in twenty in twenty twenty one, because the amount of liquidity being drained from the whole stock market is just getting lower and lower and lower. Right, the the spigot is being pulled back; it's being turned off, <laughs> and that's affecting how strong cycles are working in the microcap space and how long they're lasting for. And then you have to get a sense of when, when it's about to change, because you can start getting really aggressive um, and make a lot of money early in the morning. It's hard. It's a, I, I still make mistakes doing it, but that's, it's, it's, it's so sudden changes where people aren't expecting things is when the big, the big moves to the upside and the big moves to the downside happened. Um, so. Gotcha. Um, now you mentioned the dilution phase. Are you considering like the cash uh, they have on hand, and are you using like yeah. a tool like Dilution Tracker? To, oh yeah, I use Dilution this? Tracker. I was like one of their early, early, early like beta testers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, uh, I'm a huge fan. Yeah. So cash need is always a big thing. Um, cash need also how recent the dilution is. I always tell people like if you have an ATM that's like less than a month old. I think UBX might have been like that. They they might have had an ATM that was like a month or two old at the most, maybe. Um, those could be insane fades because they're they're, they're just looking to take because you know they're interested in using it. That's the thing. If you see warrants or an ATM from one two, especially more than one year ago, and especially like two or more years ago, it's like why haven't they tapped into that? Like they've had high volume days. Um, why haven't I think wasn't. What what ran today? Um, there's a couple. Uh, I mean, the big one. I'm sorry. What, let's see what they do. Oh, CTMX and ARDX both had. Oh yeah, that's right. Both yeah. had um, <clears throat> both had dilution. But it's like for CTMX, I was looking at that. I was like, this thing's like more than a year old or about a year old, but they haven't tapped into it at one dollar at all. Like if you read through the filings, like. And or also dilution track tracker tells you this. It's like they haven't tapped into that at all, even though they've had some volume traded over the past year. It's like, why haven't they tapped into that? Right. So it's like that's a factor of like maybe they're not really looking to use that. Um that being said, I did short it, uh, but it just chopped around it. I I, I broke even on it. It just didn't didn't do anything. Um now ARDX, uh, uh, I traded that one, so that's fresh yeah. in my head. That one is probably a good example of that pre-market uh push. On the, the phase three news, uh, they yeah. had like a, a FDA. Then FDA released. Yeah. Thing but it's, but it's not confirmed yet. And like there was some right. bearish reports. So it was a mix, a mixed bag. And also the float is giant. Yeah. Last year, the float was like half. They need yeah. some cash. And then you right. see it pop up in the pre-market. It was up already like 70%. Yeah. And then they have some dilution, I believe. And it just like, as soon as that 9 a.m. happened, just like you mentioned, or... 
Most well, that it. one, right. That one was just an immediately, and we can talk about um, pre-market action could tell you a lot about what's going to happen at market open. Not all the time, but sometimes it gives some big, big keys about, there's certain patterns that I'll straight up trade just based on what happened in the pre-market. Um, ADRX, I thought would be really choppy because even though they did have that dilution um, and, the, and the float was really thick, the institutional ownership was quite high. So I thought, I'm like, man, this thing might just, like, I thought it might, get, I was like, oh man, okay, if it pushes, I'll think about shorting it if it pushes, but if it pulls back, I, I thought it would find support after maybe a 10% pullback and then push back up. So I was like, oh, I'll just kind of avoid it. So I actually missed that whole morning. <laughs> Sadly, missed that whole morning fade. Um, it's one of those things where I, I was kind of too long bias and uh, um, I just, sometimes you're long bias and it doesn't do the thing. And uh, I thought, you know, it's kind of gapping up above all of its levels for the past year and yeah. high IO and um, it had that big day like two days ago and maybe there's some swing shorts that are a little bit trapped and they want to get out. I'm like, oh, maybe it'll give at least some push, like some type of push, but it went straight down. Um, interestingly enough, they did a very, uh, I always recommend people record their screens, um, record their tape and record their charts. Um, I actually use, I, I review my recordings more than I actually review charts. Um, you know, I do, I still record all my charts. Um, but they did a very like interesting level two trick that um, in level two in tape reading is one of those things where it's noise 99% of the time until it's not. <laughs> there's, there's times where it's not noise, uh, but most of the time it is. And then, you know, that's where, um, you know, your, your, your skill level and experience comes into play. But ARDX and market open, it had that big dump and then it got down to 1.8 and then somebody so if you if you look at the tape, somebody was refreshing the bid on 1.8 um, really heavy, really, really heavy. And that's why I thought it was going to push because somebody I absorbed like a million shares. Like it was an in, like a common trick is to let the bid get all the way down to zero. So there'll be like 200K on the bid. And it'll get completely even. It'll go down to zero and then refresh back up to 200K. So an instant refresh. So it, it like tricks people into thinking it's about to break support, but then, a, you know, another fat bit comes in, another fat bit comes in and then it push. I was like, oh, cool. Maybe it might push to two and I'll short kind of like a $2 clear out. Maybe it'll just want to clear out $2 in VWAP and slam back down. I was like, oh, maybe that'll happen. So I was interested if that happened, but it ended up just denying, um, just given a, a, a weak bounce, it denied the MAs. Uh, it was following the five minute nine. So I use moving averages a lot in terms of just like, Usually not in terms of entries, but in terms of just analyzing a trend. Um, there's a few setups I have that do actually use moving averages as confirmation for shorting, but most of the time I just use it as a um, a guideline, right? It's a guide that tells me where the stock is moving. I also use it. It's really good for profit taking. Um, but uh, yeah, it bounced into one of the MAs and then it rolled back down to 1.8. And I'm like, man, maybe I should short this. Like, like so many people, so many longs, went long based on that soak in that push like if it comes back down and cracks 1.8 it, it might just keep going down and it did um but i don't know I, I was just it's sometimes it's hard to get out of that long bias in your head like oh maybe i'll just wait for another push and then the the thing you thought might happen does happen and you're just like well what can i what can i do uh, i can't do anything <laughs> but I did, I did i did end up shorting a uh it gave a pretty clean what i call a floor wash um what people might just call like a support crack um uh, at 108, I actually shorted it exactly at 108, and it broke a really fat 182 bid uh, that was holding it up for about 20 minutes. Um, classic floor, floor wash pattern. Uh, that trade matrix is the one who talks about that one a lot. Um, shorted that, went down like 10 cents, came back up, and then uh, made a little, made a tiny bit of money on it. So, um, but with that, with the high IO, I thought that the odds of this going super far down especially on a bounce like that like it's not high um it, it, fundamentals can give you some keys of like what is possible in terms of fade potential right um so like high io is, is sometimes you, you you get beautiful short patterns uh beautiful clear outs and all this type of stuff and fade potential is maybe eight to ten percent and that's it and then it just soaks super heavy comes back up um and if you're just treating all stocks the same uh, you know, you could have a four million four dollar stock with a fifty percent IO with a hundred million float, 
And that's different than a $4 stock with a 10 million flow and 0% institution ownership. Those are going to act differently, right? So um, I, do, I took profits on that decently fast because I thought it, it wouldn't go, and it didn't go that far down either. So um, yeah, that's an example from today of how kind of I view the market, how I trade. So, so what's your, t- so, okay, so the institutional ownership, and you said you uh, how like a uh, 100 million float stock with 50% IO acts different than a 10 million float stock with a no institutional. Yep. So what's your under, okay, so you, you, you've you gone down these rabbit holes, trade the matrix, um, all day faders, that explains, I need to revisit that stuff some more, actually. Yeah, I oh. recommend reading all day faders, yeah. old, old tweets, man. They're, they're, they're great. But yeah, so go good. But yeah, um. What's what's your understanding or what's your I guess theory of of the reasoning for this kind of behavior with the IO? Is it they, they right. have certain algos? Is it they lock up some certain part of the float? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, from my general perspective, I just think of where's the money coming from, right? Like where, like where's the money really coming from? Like when something is giving support, like is it some guy who soaked a bunch of shares early on and maybe we're in a weak market? Um, and he's just looking to give a couple pushes, hide a clear out, fade back to where it came from. You know, PEGY earlier this week gave a really nice, um, classic, classic clear out. Um, but so PEGY I know is, for example, is lower flow, previous multi-day runner, uh, tons of bags, you know, previous, especially previous runners like that are, aren't likely to go back to up to where they came from. Right. You know, SONN was another one recently, you know, kind of what people call a bounce short, you know, um, backside short, whatever you want to call it. Um, but that's an example of something I know has no IO. <laughs> it's something that just has back holders and it's just something that somebody is abusing the backside swing short liquidity to just pump up a stock, you know, attract the people who who saw the big run a month or two ago that want to get back in. And they're just looking to, you know, set a few short traps and set one big clear out and th- that's going to come back down to the three minute 200 to five minute 200 EMA. And it's just going to, you know, essentially fade 20% from whatever the final big liquidity move that had happened. But as opposed to IO, high IO, you, know, you see this a lot with biotech stocks. Uh, yeah, you, you'll get a, a biotech stock that'll gap up from five to ten dollars. You know, it's a hundred percent gap up, and everyone's like, "Ooh, a hundred percent gap up! It's amazing." But it's it's a, a thicker flow, sixty percent IO positive phase three new stock that you know in the morning liquidity might give a good pattern, but as soon as as soon as like the initial, if there even is a weak move, um, it's just it's just like endless soaking, and it, it'll come down ten percent, and it, it's just like. If anything, it just has short traps the rest of the day. It just grinds up, clears out, comes back, grinds up, clears out, comes back, grinds up, clears out, comes back, grinds up. It just keeps doing that over and over and over again. Um, and in my mind, it's just like, okay, um, you know, some some institution somewhere has an algo that says, and when it comes back to this moving average or whatever they're using, just buy here, and and they're just selling on the big blow off moves and re soaking, and it's just it's just a grindy. And you can just track this. It's not hard. It's not hard to find what the IO is of stocks. Just just whenever you put, copy and paste your charts, post the basic information, which is float, which is institutional ownership, which is dilution. Put in the news if you want. Um, usually news isn't that important, but sometimes it is. Uh, and then that way you'll just have a general idea. Then you like after a couple of years, not even a couple of years, you could go back, you could back test this. But after a year or two of doing this, like you'll notice, like, oh high IO is really choppy and I should probably just avoid it. You know what I mean? And, and, and then, or, or I should like adjust my profit taking measures in some way. And then if something's zero IO, it's like, okay, well, um, that tends to be more of a, uh, uh, candidate for either just weak push and fade or manipulation. Maybe it's a tiny flow, you know, zero percent IO actually kind of tells me that if something's gapping up really strong that maybe one guy has decided to take control of the flow and you know that's a possible candidate for just rigged you know manipulated stock and then my mind changes to okay let me look for the manipulated stock patterns that i trade um so kind of the fundamentals can give me an idea of like what type of moves to expect um 
when to be careful, and then market conditions, right? Like how, how weak or strong is the market, right? So stuff like that. Um, hope that answers your question. Yeah, okay. So talking about that, let's say there's a low float stock and there's a some guy with a lot of money, a hundred million dollar account or whatever, <laughs> decides to say, else. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a, a large portion of this tiny float. Yep. And um, you know, if they hold it, this is my thinking. I mean, if if it, who knows if they abide by the rules or not, because the rules are just all over the place. Yeah, uh, sure. So like Technically, they have to report if they own six percent right. of the of the float, or five yeah. more than five percent of the float, if it's short or not. But yeah. uh, and then they theoretically they they get rid of their position by the end of the day. Like, uh, right. have you have you tracked that at all to see if that if they comply with that, or do they just sometimes? Because it I seems don't. like sometimes they they these rigors go on for days. <laughs> yeah, and who knows? Who knows if they're just using multiple accounts? You know, that's true. Um, you know, it's like, who knows if they have multiple people coordinating it? You know, example, uh, something recently that's like just your classic rigged example is um, TBLT. The, the last earlier this week um, yeah. no, uh, it was a classic example of pushing a stock, a low float stock into a higher close, right? The higher close raises the nominal float value, which allows you to raise more money and then Lo and behold, it goes sideways for a day, and then H.C. Wainwright does an offering in the pre-market, and it goes down 30%, right? It's just like, wow, another H.C. Wainwright full-day manipulation yeah. into, an, into a higher close. Um, and, you know, I was actually shorting. I was shorting because the, what they were doing is they were just doing high-day clearouts, break support by a few cents, so high-day clearout. And I was shorting those high-day clearouts, but sooner or later, I'm just like um, – because I saw I saw the fundamental information and I knew it's like oh maybe they are going for a higher close on this um you know to the the raise the float uh to to do an offering and when I see that many high day clearance getting soaked um especially in this type the, what's bad about this type of environment is since liquidity is leaving the system stocks are getting thin they're getting very thin um which is annoying because <laughs> the, the problem with thin stocks is that it's very easy to soak thin stocks. It's very easy to break support by a few cents. You know, when, you know, we saw this with, uh, um, we saw this with, uh, what stock ran yesterday? That was a one. Oh, I and M. Uh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. A one million full stock. But I was like, hate I was like, pump, by the way, it was yeah, a yeah. Hate, hate pump. <laughs> it had, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, again, my thinking with like, you know, people always tell me it's like, oh, it's a paid pump and there's this chat room and that chat room, which is all good information. But in my mind, it's like, okay, that's just extra liquidity for whoever's really moving this to like, yeah. like just, just move the stock. But I and M, it was like, it pulled back like 5% from high day and it was trading like 15,000 shares a minute. I'm like, it's so thin. Like, this is so, 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 so thin. Um, and I have a rule that if something ever gets too thin, I can only trade liquidity events. So it's like, where, what are they looking to clear out? What? What levels are they painting on the chart? Um, what are some common tricks that they do? So INM, INM did a really, really, really common trick. If you want to talk about, you know, the candlesticks in, in level two specifics, where at um, 1041, uh, INM had this very clear support level painted um, on its shelf. So like the, the 10 minutes it was trading was a very clear support. Break support, everyone thinks it's weak goes down like three cents. And then you just see massive market orders coming in on the tape, like pushing it up, like instant pushing it up. And this is actually a really common trick where people think that's really strong, right? It broke support, tons of buying coming in. It's pushing, okay, this is going to break high day, be insanely strong. But this is actually all just a trick to abuse liquidity, right? They know people will buy based on the support reclaim, especially since it's right below high day. They know if they break support and bring it back right below high day, people are just going to buy expecting a huge breakout. But the problem is the market's weak. There isn't enough liquidity in the system. They, they're, they're limited. Whoever's soaking these shares is limited by how much money is in the, the micro cap space as a whole and in that stock, right? So it's like, I'm looking now, it's like, this will not be able to push uh, I saw that trick. I was like, oh, this is a great trick. Um, and I pointed this out. This happened on the ALLK dilution fade. That was a intraday parabolic, but a sick. Yeah, that was like I one of my biggest trades. Um, in, was in that a, a that bit. was what was the IO on that one? I remember it was a, it was a little higher, but it, higher, it, gave, right? yeah. it, it gave a per sometimes 
sometimes there's perfect tacticals in a perfect yeah. situation. Yeah, it was a perfect one. Yeah, I remember it's one I of those, like, that one. It's one of those things where it's it's sometimes certain factors when they're extreme enough override other factors, right? Yeah, <laughs> like just sometimes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so you can have all the I O and stuff you want, but sometimes you're just like I'm looking it's, at yeah. Because yeah. ALK, I think that also had an ATM that was like a month or two old. I'm like they're going to tap into that, and they did that trick where it's consolidating for 10, 15 minutes. It breaks support. You know, everyone's shorting all the longs who set their stop losses down there. They're all getting stopped out. All the shorts are getting in and then it comes back up, breaks high a day, and then just 2 million volume slam candle back down. Cause that it's all liquidity game, right? They're just trying to create as much buying pressure from all the short sellers getting stopped out and from all the longs chasing back up. Um, yeah. That's a, that's a way for them to, okay, if I want to dump as much of this ATM as possible at the highest average, like this is the, this is what you do. This is the pattern you use. Um, so INMM did that. And I was a little slow to react on that one because INMM did that trick and it pushed too high day, which is 4.75 and it stalled. I think, the, I'm pretty sure there was a hidden seller, which if, if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's, it's when somebody hides their order on the, on the level two, right? So the level two is showing 100 shares, but there's tens of thousands of shares going into it and it's not moving, right? And you're so, watching the tape for that. Yeah, right? I'm watching level two the in the tape. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then it goes back up, it hits that level. And then I'm like, okay, if this falls below 4.7 i'm just gonna short and it did i shorted and then that was the big move um at that time of day for that pattern and then it just did choppy low flow low volume stuff but it faded and then i shorted it again in the afternoon where it did another extremely common manipulated pattern where uh, what i call a bid prop which is where you do a series of higher highs and higher lows to make it look really strong so you got higher highs and higher lows for like 30 40 50 60 minutes and it's going it's like three percent below high day two percent below high day everyone everyone's thinking oh man this is gonna huge huge you know huge bull flag it's gonna go to the moon and then it comes right below it it rejects it and you know and i always hear short sellers telling me it's like oh man dude i was waiting for high day to short it but it didn't it didn't get there i was like yeah it, that's why the pattern works the pattern works is because you're waiting to short it you didn't short it and then all the longs who are waiting you know to to they're holding for the breakout they're trapped and the stock just, you know, it breaks its trend line. And I like to short before, because sometimes you have to short before the trend breaks, because otherwise, um, A, you miss out on a ton of profits. B, there's always a chance that, that, they, they, that, that they soak and bring it back up. So a lot of these like manipulated patterns, you have to have good averages and you have, you have to see them forming as they're happening so that you get, a good, so yeah, I short it again in the afternoon and then in it, did a big crack and I just held until end of day. Cause I was like, okay. Um, they held $4 support throughout the day. It'll probably at the very end of the day, it'll probably just dump the rest of their shares. Like however many shares are holding, it'll just crack straight through that. And that's what happened. And it was a good trade. Um, that's one of my better trades this week. So two really nice, um, uh, manipulated rigged patterns with, with level two and tape confirmation, at least on the first one, um, that all stack up. And, and then INEMA is a classic rigged stock because the float's so low and there's no institutional ownership. And the float is uh, like 2 million? million. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, like it's super really tiny. Low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, Anything gosh. under 5 million in your brain should already be, especially if it's a top stock up on the day, should just yeah. be in your brain like, okay, there's probably going to be some games. Whatever I think is the first short is probably not the first short. <laughs> it's probably, yeah. whatever you think is, it's probably going to come, it, wait for the second short. That's that's always usually on rigged stocks. It's usually, it, it depends. A lot of it, a lot of this stuff depends. But, um, that's usually the, the the play for sure. Yeah, they'll have you think it's done, then it does a second leg, it breaks the high a day, and then yeah. you know, or two or three times. But okay, yeah. so so institution no no, we went over institutional ownership. Now, what about insider ownership? Well, how do you how do you consider that like as opposed to institutional ownership? I personally don't track it that closely. Um I don't know. I just haven't found any way of incorporating it. That makes sense to me. And I, in terms of people I follow, I haven't really had a solid idea of, you know, they haven't shared anything that really resonated with me on it. So I can't, I can't talk much about it. I got you. And the, the reason why I'm asking, because uh, I want to see your opinion on it, because like, I remember FNGR earlier this year, or earlier, yeah. like a month ago, mm -hmm. that one had a high, in, high insider ownership. And from what I understood from asking around and the, oh, dilution tracker, you could chat with the guy. And he was yeah. telling me, Sean, the guy's name is Sean, apparently, the chat guy. Yeah. 
And he's telling me, oh, in, uh, insider ownership, that means that uh, if they own six, 60% of the float, the, the float is actually 60% less. And they're yep. controlling it. And it's and it's mm-hmm. a, it's Chinese-related stock. Yep. So the, for me, re, ever since that, uh, I look at see insider ownership, especially with the Chinese stock, because that's like yeah. the Chinese are almost like uh, insider. It feels like institutional ownership when I trade it because yeah. like they're controlling it. it. It just float restriction. Right. And usually some places like dilution track is usually pretty good at incorporating that into their flow number um, in terms of massive. We saw this with the um, all those all those super thin China IPOs that were making 10,000 percent moves. You know, HKD was the big one. Um, yeah. I didn't trade any of any of those. I traded ATMD when it pumped, but uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, oh, yeah, that was the easier one. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. but also like uh, HKD was like not even tradable. I, I don't yeah. know why people were shorting it, uh, but that's an example of ninety nine point nine percent of the flow was just locked by some Singapore, Hong Kong guys somewhere, and then. And the people who the financiers who did those IPOs are like these six tier sh- shady like micro cap like financiers who do these like really weird. You can go down that rabbit hole. Um, who, who these financiers are for the IPOs and then and, and then like what types of companies they tend to work with. But that's a good example of when people you know people see a stock up ten thousand percent, they think it can't go on up any higher, but. At the same time, this stock HKD is trading a hundred shares a minute. Okay, hundred shares. There's there's no yeah. participation in this. There's, yeah. No one's participating. It's so thin that anything could happen. And and if you're thinking about trading based on just raw percentages um, on an MDR, how much something's gapped up in a pre market, it's like like you're gonna get like like volume is so important like liquidity and volume determines patterns it determines how stocks move like if like who's participating how many people are participating like all of that stuff determines w- what moves and how much so it's like if you're not incorporating volume and liquidity and and, and trying to gain a deeper understanding of it um you're just gonna get caught you're gonna get caught and, and you know and, or you're gonna have situations where uh uh there's a there's a significant change in behavior. We saw this with ILAG when ILAG did yeah. its parabolic. You know, so many people were used to China pumps fading, um, giving nasty fades, right? The China pump ends and then it's just straight down like 80, 90% of the day. And everyone's expecting that, right? But if you look at how the liquidity of those situations work, those massive like 80% dumps on these China on, on these China pumps um, are usually very thin. They, they usually dump like 100,000 shares a minute. It gives a little balance, dumps 100, 200,000 shares. It's not very liquid, but it, it's just liquid enough for the dump because you know, everyone's trying to get out, but it's not very liquid. But I was watching ILAG and I remember watching the tape on that and I was just like, oh my God. I was like, this was before it went parabolic. This was like in the morning when it was at four or $5. Yeah. And, I, and then I saw these massive, massive uh, offers come in on the ask and the bid. It was like 100, 200, 300,000 shares. And it was like, it's like all these people, because it was on SSR. So all these people were stacking the uh, second offer trying to get in on this like China China dump. You know, that's what everyone's thinking. Um, so it gave a, a really classic bullish pattern in the right situation where you, I mean, it's, it's very simple. You, you break low a day by a few cents and you bring it back up. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, then, yeah. and then, you know, I saw like 600,000 shares on the ask and they broke low a day and it ate through all of those shares. Like I saw like that, like, like, I'm like, this is not how a, a pump dumps dump. Like, this is not how they work. How they work is just like, you see like 2,000, 3,000 shares. It's just down. It's just hitting the tape. Gives a little s- small bounce. Another 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 shares hit the tape. Small bounce. Like that's usually how dumps work. Like dumps don't work by 600,000 shares on the ass getting eaten up in 10 seconds. So I was like, this is crazy. But yeah, I noticed if I didn't long, I should have longed it. But, uh, you know, hindsight's 20, 20 uh, But I'm not a long master. So I wasn't confident in myself. But I, I saw it get eaten up. And then once it started going parabolic, I was like, all those people are trapped. Like they're all, tra- like everyone expecting this China pump is trapped. Um, and there, and it, it's just going to be a nasty squeeze. Um, and yeah, it, it just went it went up two hundred percent, and people lost incredible. Money. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it halt to halt. It didn't even have the chance to like even yep. breathe. It's like oh, halt, yeah. halt. You know, yep, people, so. people, they're they're brokers market ordering straight up, and yeah. um, it, it shows you 
but that's an example of how liquidity and in, in volume and tape rating in level two could give you an idea of behavior changes, like something very not normal. Like you have to know what's normal and then you have to know yeah. what it gets. The thing is also like black swans, right? They don't happen that often, right? So it's not like you get tons and tons of experience, um, you know, have dealing with those situations, which is why they happen. Um, but I knew enough to stay out of it. You know, I didn't, I didn't short anywhere in that. I, I was just watching and I was like, this is not, I, yeah, that was I knew enough to at least not shorten in the morning, right? <laughs> right. Short to fade, but, uh, I knew enough not to shorten the morning just cause behavior change, you know, just, uh, that's not normal. You gotta know that. You yeah. Know? I'm, I'm glad, you know, so I, I've, we've talked about I lag a few times on the podcast, but the way you described, the the offer and the level two and all that, that's, yeah, that's those are really good observations. You know, that's that's probably the most violent squeeze I've ever seen. Not the biggest squeeze I've ever yeah. seen, but the most violent one. Like it's been a while since we had one like that. Like that you know, it's yeah. been like since 2020, 2021 since we had that. Yeah, that's, of, you know, like those Kodak was... squeezes. You know what I mean? Oh man, Kodak. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> you know those type of squeezes. But yeah, uh, it's in, um, interesting. So Kodak was the the Trump squeeze, and like now Trump, uh, I guess DWAC is it ran out of gas. Like it's kind yeah. of done. Well, yeah. <laughs> But you, uh, one of your questions and your thing you sent me was like, what's some like most memorable type of stock that I remember? Yeah, yeah, for and, sure. Um, one was DWAC, DWAC day one. I was looking at that flag. I longed it at $18, sadly sold it on like the first push. <laughs> like I did not, but I made a, but that was one of those things where I was like Trump pump. I was like, this is a Trump pump. This is going to go you know, like, and then I made a joke on Twitter. I was like, this is going to a hundred dollars. And I sold it at like 25. <laughs> I bought it 18, sold it at 25. I thought I was a genius. I was like, oh Wait, man. It I, did. It did go. It went to like 150, right? It went up, It went to like 160, 170 or something like that. Um, that was the next day. But I, I that was hey, one of those situations. People like, forget he was the pumper in chief, you know? Oh yeah. yeah and you, you have to like, you have to like have those. You, you, you almost have to be able to calculate that in your mind. It's like, once I saw that flag for it, it was also trading like, like 4 million shares a minute. It was like an $18 yeah, stock. That was and, I was insane. Like, and I was yeah. like, Trump pump. I was like, this is so, so strong. Um, but yeah, uh, what was great about that is um, the next two days, we had all those sympathy plays. Uh, PHUN, CRTD. That's right. Mark, um, I made more money. That, that was my first, those were that day, the next day and the day after that were like my two biggest days by far um, at the time, like two huge, huge, huge monster days because, um, because sympathies, I mean, once, once the main runner, I mean, sympathy plays are the best because once the main runner dies, it's, 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 uh, it's game over. <laughs> it's game over for the sympathies. And then you get 50% plus fades on the sympathies. And then you get plays like, um, uh, Mark, well, Mark was one of them, and uh, well, Mark did what FNGR did. I shorted FNGR the day it uh, um, FNGR went it gapped up to like ten dollars in the after hours, and then the next morning it faded really hard to seven, like 7.5. And everyone was like, I'm gonna wait for a push to 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 to, to push this up. But I remembered a stock called HX, another Chinese company, yes, yeah, right. Um, and HX did the same. I pointed out on my Twitter, I was like, This, I was like. I was like, guys, what was the ticker? What was the Chinese ticker from like a year ago that ran? Because it did the same thing where it was a multi-day runner, but the first five or six days were really thin. And then the seventh day got really heavy volume. And then it like, so it went from like one to 10 on nothing. And then it went from 10 to 20 on a bunch of volume. And then it dumped really hard the next day. And I was like, and I saw HX do that. I was like, FNGR, if it shows distribution in the pre-market, which it did, uh, I was like, it might pull an HX and they might just dump into the market open volume. And I was like, if it goes straight down, I'm going to short it. And I did, I shorted it in, in the sevens. And then I covered it. I actually covered at five. It was like one, yeah. <laughs> one of my great bottom ticks. Uh, I was like, I'll cover at five. That's a good number. And, I was like, <laughs> and then it, uh, that ended up being the bottom, but uh, yeah. And then it bounced, it bounced back. It did. It uh, came yeah. back up to like nine, uh, but yeah. Um, but yeah, that's an example of, of kind of, you know, trading matrix talks about that, like themes tend to repeat themselves, certain moves tend to repeat themselves that fit similar criteria. And I was like, hey, maybe FNGR pulls an HX and it goes straight down. And I remember missing HX. So I was like, I'm going to short FNGR. And it did. It did go straight down. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, sometimes that happens. Sometimes it's a crazy thousand percent pump and then market open comes the next day and it goes straight down. You know, and then some, yeah. sometimes you have to know that in your head that that's a possibility. And, uh, you know, short it and then 
if it starts working, maybe add a tiny bit more. Um, but you did ask me in the document. I, I do tend to, uh, I try to get as much of my position in as, at, you know, the liquidity event as possible. I do try to get, I, I, I don't uh, use starters and then add as it gets higher. I don't do that. And I also, when I add, if it goes lower, so I'm in the money, I will add, but I'll add maybe a, a third of what my position currently is. So I do a small add at the bottom just to protect my average. It is just my personality. I don't like yeah. screwing up my average too much. Even though there's some situations where it actually calls for it, like a eye lag on the way down was the situation where it called for it, but I just can't wrap my head around it. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, that's that's. I, I like to target those very specific either manipulation, you know, clear outs are the easy ones to understand, high day clear outs, range clear outs. Um, those are the easy ones to understand. Or a thing like a bid prop where I might scale in a little bit because I know it's just propping. So I was like, oh, maybe the prop, I don't know when the prop's going to end. So I'll like, I'll wait a good amount of time, like 30, 40 minutes, and I'll just start adding as it slowly starts grinding up. But that's one of the few situations. Usually I like to, I like to go in almost all my size if I can, uh, right away if I can. <laughs> so for um, sure. that's just how, I don't, I don't like adding losers. Uh, I don't, I don't revenge trade. I don't add. A, I don't ignore my risk. My risk is pretty tight. Because um, the thing is, when you sh when you trade like I do, and you short liquidity events, like you short clearouts and stuff, like I'm pretty much just risking right above the clearouts. And I'm trying to get in at like, like I'm, div I've been good enough to understand that the time to short is when high day breaks. Like you short above higher day. Like that's a so your average is as good as possible. So that way, A, you make the most money when it works, but B, if it doesn't work, you can get out, you know, for maybe a one or two percent loss as opposed to waiting for the clear out to happen and shorting at the bottom, which is what I used to do when I first started because I didn't know what I was doing. But uh but yeah, that's it's it's uh since I'm shorting those very specific specific events, um, I can have tight risk on, on my on my trades. So um yeah, I, I hate I hate too much risk. I'm not, I'm not that type, I'm not a revenge trader type of person. Like, uh, like losses make me want to trade less. <laughs> like that, that is a uh, that's usually what happens. Absolutely, man. Um, okay, so like, what about the, your thoughts on the market conditions? Because okay, so compared to the past couple of years, like this market has been um, a lot different. You saw they're talking about less liquidity in the markets. Uh, yep. A lot of short sellers. It seems like it's overcrowded with short sellers. And how has been like that? How has that affected like all the observations and the patterns you trade? Just like yeah, I would say uh, the big thing I'm noticing besides the obvious thinness, right, of of how thin stocks are getting, um, which I I say out of a lot of trades because how how like INMM was like the 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 lowest in terms of thinness that I'll go like um because but yeah in terms of uh the market yeah it's clear that um you're seeing We've seen it already where the market will get really strong, but in 2020, 2021, when the market got strong, it would last like six to eight weeks. Like it would last a really, you'll have a, you'll have a few dead days in there, but you'll have some new thing pushing 150% in the pre-market, uh, 20 million volume. Uh, that's what 2020, 2021 was like. But we saw in October, which was kind of like the last, like beginning mid-October was kind of like the last strongish period uh, when PGY and uh, those MDRs were pushing. Um, it you would have like one or two strong days and then you have like almost instant weakness and then you would have a couple strong days and then weakness and then after two weeks it'd be like over and then it'd be back to being a weak market again and uh you're seeing strong cycles last not as long um you're seeing more thinly thin stocks being manipulated you gotta be people gotta be careful with thin stocks man like um it's easy to think okay if there's not a lot of volume in this it'll clear out high day and go straight down which sometimes it does but it, like thin thin stocks are easy to move like i said earlier thin stocks are easy to move uh and you gotta be careful because they can just grind and grind and grind and grind and grind with not a lot of participation so my mind is thinking that it's like you you really got to be more selective especially also less range means less opportunity and that means if the more you're wrong the less chances you have to make money right so um it, a lot of it is is trading the more liquid stocks. Um, you know, I'll look for if it fits my morning short criteria. You know, something that pops at nine a.m. or maybe something that has recent dilution. I might be aggressive early. Um, but if not, I'm waiting for 
at some type of push, like like a PGY uh, a couple of days ago. I'm looking for a couple pushes, and then I'm looking for some type of chart painting. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for them to paint a certain level so I can I can target. And then I'm like look at the level two in the tape. I'm waiting for a very specific event to happen, and then. Because the thinner stocks get, you have to, like I said on my Twitter a couple of days ago, it's like you got to wait for those big volume liquidity events. Like you got to wait for them because uh, it's too easy to get in too low and, and have a stock trade 15,000 shares a minute and have it come, you know, three, five percent back up from your entry. It's too easy. So, uh, yeah, I think that's the mark. It's getting harder. It's, 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 you can't just rely on insane range, you know. All these people who relied on stocks being up 80, 100% plus, uh, you know, the, those opportunities are going to be few and far between. And we'll have, to, you know, there'll, there'll be strong moments um, in the market, in the micro cap. There's always strong cycles uh, that come into the micro cap market. But unless there's some big macro event, because uh, the, Fed, the Fed turned off the liquidity pumps. <laughs> I mean, that is why micro caps went crazy it wasn't just yeah, retail right. work from home participation it was the fed pumping five trillion dollars into the market yeah. um you know that liquidity has gone and uh you you can't rely on big range for making a few mistakes you know with lower range if you make a few mistakes you're, you're lucky to make your money back you know sometimes depending on you know what's what's happening so um yeah like trade has talked about this a little bit like it's it's it's, big, it's going back to being a higher skill level requirement environment, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's some guys out there uh, who, you know, I think, it, I don't follow many of the chat room guys, but from what I understand, I, I think Ducks is the type of guy who who just waits for really outrageous, yeah. crazy big moves. And that, that, hey, that, that, that's a good way to make them just wait for the crazy eye legs to happen. <laughs> and, yeah. then, and then sit back for three weeks and wait for something other crazy thing to happen, you know? Yeah. Um, you can trade like that, but if you're if 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 you're kind of trading the markets and you're trading manipulation liquidity every day, kind of like I am, it's 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 just you, you, it's you just have to yeah, yeah I'm, have, I'm doing have the to, same thing yeah, but you have to you have to know a little more than yeah. you used to, and that's why we're doing this podcast, man. You know, like I, that's how I, that's that's part of the reason why I like doing the podcast. This podcast is more like for for the real for traders that you know that want to take it to the next level and really dive deep into the markets, like this whole discussion we're having. Yeah, just some really, really great observations, man. You really, you're like, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> you're legit. Okay, so, um, to start to wrap it up, so, um, where do you see yourself in the future with trading? Oh man, I, of course, I'd always like to improve in the small cap space, right? Um, got to get better at going long in the beginning of the strong cycles, right? That's really uh, the best time. I love to, to 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 get better at long, seeing the strength early seeing the money flow into the in, into the small cap space and 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 really nailing down a few long patterns that you go big on um that'd be great and then once uh, and in the future i'd also like to um once the next bull market whenever whenever the fed decides to turn the liquidity pump back on um learn to swing longs you know get out of the get out of the small cap space um i'm sure you know who qual qual maggie oh my yeah, qual maggie yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i love i personal hero of mine i know he doesn't trade small he, he trades the big black swan events but um i personal hero of mine just in terms of what he's done and how he views the market you can learn a lot just by even if even though he doesn't even if you only trade small caps you can learn a lot just by watching go on youtube and watch his old streams and just to listen to him how he talks about just look how he enters stocks how he sets risk management how he just like sits back doesn't let things affect him he just sits back and goes, i'll put i'll put my risk here and then he just goes and does something else and if it works he, he just it, 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 it it's it's so systematic and the way he just views like uh and, and he's been in the market for 10 years and he made 100 million dollars right um just 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 so many great great lessons um not not just about swing longing but just about psychology and dealing with your emotions and stuff like yeah. it, it's so drilled into his head that uh it, it's 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 insane how automatic it feels so i was like man i there's just some things i still struggle with <laughs> you know like there's always like those little things like um for me it's like for, you know something i completely in the future i want to completely get rid of of course is um missing the big move miss like waiting for that big clear out to happen missing it and and i saw this problem but like oh i'll get in 
even though I missed the move, I'll get in with 25% size down here. I, I never make money on those. I don't know why I do it. I press my button and I never make money on them. And I'm like, dude, I gotta, I gotta stop. I, I would, you know, I lose like a tiny, it's such a small amount that I lose. I'm like, but those small amounts add up over time. And it's just like, I, like, I just gotta be the type of trader that just accepts that I missed the thing that I was waiting for. And the day, unless something else happens, the day's over. <laughs> like there's nothing else to do. Um, so yeah, there's, it's, it's, it's really, it's insane how many times you have to learn the same lesson over and over again. You know what I mean? Trading, trading yeah. I always tell you, it's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. So. Absolutely, man. And um, any, you mentioned for, for the readings of Trade the Matrix and who's the other guy? Yeah, All Day really Faders. Good. Any, any, yeah. other, any books? Uh, but I, I do want to say the people in the small cap space, um, for All Day Faders, you have to use the advanced search function and go back to his like 2016, to, like 2019 tweets, like those, that's when he talked the most about a lot of the stuff I'm talking about. Um, I recommend taking notes. Uh, I think my note document on ADFs, <laughs> on my ADF tweets is like 600 pages. It's, I put it together like three years ago and I learned so much. In terms of books, um, it's funny, I don't read too many trading books, uh, but the ones I do really like, my my dog, my, <laughs> sorry, my, my, my eight month old daughter uh, uh, nice. made an appearance. Uh, <laughs> But the ones I like, of course, are Jesse Livermore, right? Yeah, reminiscences. Classic. Yeah, just classic. And um, how to trade stocks is his other book. And then yeah. a book that I really like that I read that I've been reading recently. It's very thick. It's kind of, kind of hard to fully grasp everything in this book, but I, I like it a lot. It's called uh, Capital Wars: The Rise Capital of Global Wars. Liquidity. Um, and this and is a guy from. Author? On, yeah, his author? name is Michael Howell, but his Twitter account is called Cross Border Cap cross-border cap that's his twitter handle um he's not a, obviously not a small cap trader he's that book's more about where liquidity comes from across the whole world and how it affects stock prices and market prices um it'll teach you a lot about why 2020 2021 happened why this current environment this bear market we're in this lower liquidity small cap market we're in um a lot of it's dense it goes over my head because i'm kind of dumb but uh, a lot of the good, there's a lot of good stuff um, that kind of introduce you to those concepts of, of, of what moves markets and what moves markets is not efficient market theory to any of that bullshit. It's, 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 it's money. <laughs> Money's one yeah. of the markets. <laughs> you know, uh, and where's, where is that money? And how does it flow? And where's it going? And, and what, especially the guys, because, you know, the guys with the big accounts move markets, the guys with billions yeah. of dollars, those are the guys that move markets, it, including small caps. Um, and maybe not the billionaires, but you know, there's guys with money who move smart caps, uh, and and they make decisions based on uh, uh, what's talked about in that book. Where how much you know, what factors determine how, when people decide to go risk on, and and how that money flows from mega caps, the mid caps, the small caps, the micro caps, to crypto, to OT OTCs, like how all that money all trickles down and flows. But yeah, uh, we're in a bear market. So and, interesting, and, and, and liquidity is leaving. So it's 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 the glory days. Yeah, <laughs> twenty 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 one. It's gonna be about five ten years before those days come back. Um, wow. So, yeah. So how how did you hear about that Capital Wars book? So when you hear about you know you just look oh, around. Oh, um, I felt I have a macro uh, um, Twitter list that I have, uh, and I think okay. somebody just mentioned it. Uh, it's good. Macro is one of those things. If you're in small cap space. It's not the most important thing to study macro. Uh, you're yeah. learning about the Fed, learning about it. It's not the most important thing to study. But as you gain more experience, it's yeah. helpful to pay attention to that stuff. Because we saw um, absolutely when my daughter was born, my daughter was born on March 6, 2022. I was in the hospital. That was a Sunday. I was in the hospital until Tuesday. Uh, that Those two days were the um, the energy stock pumps. when uh, uh, Oh, the oil? Yeah, yeah. What's you saw I, Indo. Um, what was yeah? I, yeah, Indo. Indo. Right? H U S A. I missed um, all of that. I was in the hospital, and I. <laughs> my oh daughter, man, <laughs> that was the best time of the year. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Because <laughs> that that's like the, that's like the DWEX situation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like well, the DWEX situation where so much. Uh, you get one or two times a year. Sympathies. Yeah, one where or two the, times a year. You target the sympathies, and then it's just, dude. I was looking at those stocks, dude. And it, I, it, <laughs> the thing is, like, those two days can can 
equal like six plus months of profits or even, you know, assuming you don't blow up, assuming you know what you're doing. You know? <laughs> yeah. A lot of people definitely blew up in that time. Um, but um, it was just up so much. Like if you short yeah. something, oh, it's up 500%. Let me short it. And it goes 2000%. Yeah, no. Yeah. So you could get caught. And then, you know, I had a couple of friends like, you know, who were like, hey, maybe it saved you, man. Maybe you would have ta- lost a ton of money. Like, yeah. That's true. Uh, but then well, your daughter was born. So that's the, I know. I, mean, I know. I'm not, Okay, I don't blame that's her. That's the best thing. <laughs> it is. The, it is the best thing. Um, so. But yeah, that's an example. Yeah, that's. Uh, uh, oh yeah. What Matt? The last thing I want to say about that was just with macro. If you were paying attention, hey, you had the war start, right? Insane. And it, but even before the war started, you saw the the the, the energy micro caps moving, yeah. right? And I was yeah, like yeah. watching. I was like, dude, these are like some like some like really nice multi-day runners forming. Um, and then if you have a good macro Twitter list of I think my macro Twitter list is actually public. I think people could just go on my Twitter and find it. Um, but uh-huh. uh, you saw them talking about it. you saw them talking to, like just some. There's a lot of smart fucking macro people, dude, who like yeah. or, who who have a lot of institutional research and who know what they're talking about. Um, uh, kind of makes me jealous of that we don't have that in the micro in the small cap space. It's, it's such a uh, a dearth of of of, of high quality information. <laughs> like it is just not a lot of information out there good, compared to like. The macro, you go to the macro space and you got like some crazy smart fucking people like calling the calling that stuff out way ahead of time. And I was like, dude, energy. And then you combine that with with the Russia war starting, and you're just like, oh man, <laughs> like yeah. this, 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 uh, um, you know, if you disrupt like you know 10, 20 percent of the world's energy supply, things go things go crazy. <laughs> crazy things start happening. Um, yeah, yeah, and uh, that that's an example of macro liquidity flowing into the micro cap space and how it moves stocks. So if you understand it from a macro perspective, you're just like, oh man, there's this, and we haven't had that since March. So it doesn't happen that often um, where uh, uh, a, a big macro catalyst can and can induce massive moves in the small cap space. And you, and you have to fact that in, in your brain, you're like, I got to be real careful with these commodity and energy stocks right now like this is a, this is a, like if you yeah. get stopped out like have a have a max daily loss have whatever but uh uh it don't don't get clumsy it's not the time to do it so but yeah that's a, that's yeah. something people can incorporate later you know absolutely well jason man it's been great uh connecting with you and this is such a, a lot of information in this podcast you know that, that's that's not really covered anywhere you know that's why I, you know so yeah. this is we talk about it on twitter but it's not really there's nowhere really right. to, to hear it like from a real trader that's that's yeah uh, like I said small cap space there's a, there's a few there's a few really high quality guys out there and uh, I'm not saying I'm one of them but there's there's guys out there that uh um shed a lot of light into how this market works and there's there, and there's not that many there's not that many of them so uh it's good it's, I, I like your podcast man uh definitely check out a few of the guys who I know who have been on your show check that out and uh it's great yeah I think people need better quality information out there for sure. Thanks. All right, Jason. Well, once again, thanks a lot for coming on and we'll talk yeah, soon. All right. All right. Thanks, man. See ya.